Thank you, uh, Dr. Dew. Jamie. Open your Bibles with me to Philippians chapter 2, where in just a moment I'm going to read a passage of Scripture that will be the foundation for today's message. And while you're turning to Philippians 2, let me echo the kind words that have been said about me and reflect those back on your president who has uh, come into our work as a president with the respect and admiration of all of us who are getting to know him and privileged to work with him. And thank you also for the kind things you said about Gateway Seminary. Gateway and New Orleans have always had an affinity for two particular reasons. One, because of the kind of, or the context in which we uh, minister, and second, because of very similar strategic choices we've made about how to deliver education uh, and ministerial training over the years. And so thank you for the longtime partnership we've shared and the close affinity we even have today. In southern Utah, there is one of the darkest places in the world that's also easily accessible. You drive a little ways down a beautiful valley, park, walk over a hill, and arrive in a place with no ambient light. There are no street lights. There are no reflections of city lights on the horizon. And the park rangers make sure there's not even a flashlight brought over the hill. And yet, the stars light the sky so brightly you can easily see to walk down to the sitting area and soak up the grandeur of the creation. That image of stars shining brightly against the darkness of the universe is the backdrop for the day's text. Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 12. The Bible says, therefore, in light of this great Christological discovery that has been outlined in the previous verses, therefore... My dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, so now not only in my presence, but even more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is working in you both to will and to work according to his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling and arguing so that you may be blameless and pure, children of God who are faultless in a crooked and perverted generation, among whom, now catch this, among whom you shine like stars in the world. By holding firm to the word of life, then I can boast in the day of Christ that I didn't run or labor for nothing. But even if I am poured out as a drink offering on the sacrificial service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you in the same way you should also be glad and rejoice with me. The end of verse 15, you shine like stars in the world. This passage of Scripture outlines for us as ministry leaders what it means to shine so brightly against the backdrop of the darkness of the world that we live in that we are noticeable in the difference that we make. So let's discover what the text says about what it means to shine like stars. First, to shine like a star simply means that you act like the Christian you claim to be. Look at the first part of the text. It says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, this text does not say work out how to be saved. It says, work out your own salvation, meaning the salvation you have received in Jesus Christ now, work it out. The verb work out is also used outside the Bible to describe what it means to work out a math problem. You remember those? When you started working a math problem and it had steps and you had to show all those steps and you had to show not only the answer but how you got to the answer? Well, that's the same word that's used here in the text to describe what you're supposed to be doing with your salvation. 
you have received salvation in Jesus Christ. And quite frankly, it can seem like a complicated math problem to work it out, but nevertheless, you are charged with this responsibility. Work out your salvation. Carry it to its full logical conclusion. Show all the steps in the actions that you're taking. Get it to the place where you're supposed to be on public display with the solution that you bring forward. Work out your salvation. In other words, act out the Christian life that you claim to have act like the Christian you claim to be. You may be thinking, that's hard. No, it's not hard, it's impossible. Except the next phrase tells us how it becomes possible. He says, as you work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for what? It is God who is working in you both to will and to work according to his good purpose. And so it is possible to work out your own salvation, or in my words, act like the Christian you claim to be, because God is at work in you. He is working out your salvation, and it is only possible for you to work out the fullness of what it means to live a life committed to Jesus Christ in the power of God and in him working through you to empower you to get this done. So we start here. We shine like stars in the universe when we act like the Christians we claim to be by trusting God to empower us to live the Christian life the way it's supposed to be lived and the way we claim uh, in in a reflection on the claim that we make of knowing Jesus Christ. But now this text becomes very specific. This general instruction, work out your salvation, and this general encouragement that God is at work in you to accomplish it, now gets very specific in its implications and its applications. You are to work out your salvation in two key areas. And when you work out your salvation in those two key areas, you will stand out so much in the world in which we're living that you will shine brightly in contrast to all the darkness around you. What are those two key areas? First, your mouth. And second, your morality. Your mouth and your morals. You're supposed to be different, very different than the darkness of the world we're living in. And that difference is not supposed to show up in some ethereal, weird kind of way where you're working out your salvation. No, it's supposed to show up in what comes out of your mouth, what you say, and in how you express your morality or how you manage your sexuality. Your mouth and your morals. Look at the text. Verse 14, do everything without grumbling and arguing. Do everything without grumbling means stop complaining, muttering, murmuring, and griping about everything. Just stop grumbling. Just give you some specific application. Stop grumbling about how hard it is to be in the ministry. Just stop it. Because when you do that, the people who are listening to you are embarrassed for you. I was recently preaching in San Diego about the mission of the gospel. Woman came publicly or came forward to talk with me afterwards and she said, thank you for that message. She said, I'm a Navy wife. My husband is deployed six months out of every year. We don't stand around and complain about it when he gets on that ship and leaves. We're a Navy family. He's out defending the cause of freedom. We're standing with him while he does that. And I thought to myself, some preacher says, well, I'm just having such a hard week. I've had to spend two nights away from my family out on visitation. And a woman like that hears that kind of grumbling, murmuring, muttering, whining, complaining, and is embarrassed for you that you don't understand what it means to give something up for the mission. Recently, I was talking with a business executive. He said, our pastor recently said that he wants to have every six weeks, every six week off from preaching. We only have one service a week, one sermon a week. He said, it's just too much of an emotional grind for him. He, he, this man came to me and said, before I respond back to him, I want to talk to you. Is that normal? I said, no, it's not normal. It's irresponsible. He said, that's what I thought. I don't get six once a week, every six off for making multi-million dollar decisions involving the lives of hundreds of employees. 
What is he thinking that he can't do his job? Complaining, whining, murmuring. In the text, grumbling. Listen, ministry leadership has what I call occupational hazards. There are some difficult things about our work. No question about that. And if you come to another uh, message on another day, I will teach you perhaps about self-care and spiritual care and why you need to take positive, proactive steps to sustain yourself over 40 years of ministry, as I have tried to do. There is a place for that. But the Bible is speaking to us very clearly this morning that when you work out your salvation in the power of God in such a way that you are demonstrably a Christian in this culture, one of the ways it will show up is you will stop grumbling about everything. And then it goes on, stop arguing. Just stop it. Arguing means disputing, debating, carrying on pointless discussions about things that don't really matter. Just turn off so much of the frivolous nonsense that's going on in public media, in social media, in public discourse and debate these days. Just stop. Just stop. When you work out your salvation in the power of God in such a way that you shine like a star, the first thing that will show up is what comes out of your mouth will be different than the people around you. You will be marked as a person who is not a grumbler and not argumentative. You will be marked as a person who speaks things that are very different than what's going on around us in our culture. Your mouth. And then the other one, your morals. Look at the next verse. So that you may be blameless and pure children of God who are faultless. Well, those are powerful words. Blameless meaning means having or needing no censure, having no defect. Pure means you're unmixed, you're unadulterated. You're like a refined metal in that the impurities of life have been cooked out of you. You are faultless, meaning without blemish or mark. And notice what those three words stand in contrast, the last part of the verse, in a crooked and a perverse generation. These words crooked and perverse means distorted, mean, uh, mean distorted, twisted, flawed, mangled. What a contrast. We are to live blameless, pure, and faultless lives in the face of a world that is perverted, distorted, twisted, and mangled. And these words, blameless, pure, and faultless, all have moral dimension and speak specifically about our moral choices. Let me be very specific about this. Blameless meaning means having no censure meaning that what you're doing in your life doesn't need to be censored. When my wife and I got married more than 40 years ago, we made a decision about our family. We decided that as a couple, we would never participate in anything for entertainment that our children could not see or do. Let me hasten to say, That did not mean our children were with us at all times when we were being entertained. My wife and I would often go out on dates or other activities without our children, but listen carefully to our commitment. We wanted to operate without censure, meaning that there was nothing about our lives that had to be censored before our children could see it. That's why I wrote about this in the character of leadership, and it's still true. That's why I'm probably the only 64-year-old man you've ever met that's never seen an R-rated movie. Why? Because I didn't want to have to censor them out of my life before my children found out that I had viewed them. Now, I'm not asking you to make a legalistic commitment. My commitment wasn't to legalism. It was to being without censure, to simply say, what can I eradicate from my life that will cause there to be no questions asked by my 12-year-old son about, Daddy, why can't I watch this with you? 
No questions asked like that. No censure. Look, today, some Christian leaders seem to want to get as close to the edge of immorality as they can without falling over into it. The Bible says get as far away from it as you can without tripping over into legalism. We don't walk as close to the edge as possible. We walk as far from it as practical and yet still remaining connected to and relevant to a culture we're trying to address. Without censure. It says that we are to be pure, unmixed, unadulterated, nothing stirred into the mix that speaks of immorality. Listen, my friends, I have lived almost all of my adult ministry life on the West Coast. It's a debauched place with every manner of evil on public display. Sounds a little bit like New Orleans. The world we're living in is mangled. It's distorted. It's twisted. To quote the verse, it's perverted. And when you live differently, you will stand out like a star in the universe. People ought to look at us as ministry leaders and say, there is something remarkably different about him or about her. Her moral choices, his moral choices, they are remarkably different and in stark contrast to the world in which we're living. We're not just a, a little bit different or a slight adjustment on this issue. We are dramatically different. So the Bible says this, act like the Christian you claim to be. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, yes, believing that God will sustain you to get it done. And when this happens, it's going to show up in two very distinct ways in your behavior, your mouth and your morals. What you say and how you express your sexuality are going to be different. Well, those are the negative aspects, if you will, but then he turns it in a different direction, starting in verse 16. He said, then also you shine like stars when you hold firm the word of life. Now, this turns into more proactive ministry activity. This phrase, word of life, I think is a best translated in our vernacular of sh as share the gospel or the gospel itself. By holding firm to the gospel or to the word of life. Now, the word hold firm is an interesting word. It it could be translated hold firm, that's accurate, and it's translated that way in most translations, but some pick up the other idea, which is also encapsulated in this word, and that is the idea of holding forth. So listen closely, it's a play on words I'm going to show you in just a moment in this text. Hold firm doesn't mean to grasp it as tightly as you can, holding firm to the word of life or holding firm to the gospel message and keeping it as close to you as possible. That's not the image that's being projected here. This word translated hold firm is a word that's used to describe holding on to a beverage or to a serving platter while you're giving it to someone. And it says hold firm to that. Don't drop it on someone. Don't spill it on someone. Hold firm to it. But it's not a holding firm in a possessive sense. It's holding firm while you're holding forth. Do you see the subtle difference? You can miss that in the English translation, but believe me, it's there in the original way this word is used in, out, in other contexts. So Paul is saying this. You want to shine like a star in the universe? Offer people the gospel. Hold on to it in such a way that you have a firm grip on it, but keep trying to give it to other people like you'd offer them a beverage or to carry them a serving platter. Get a good grip while you're trying to give it away. Hold firm to the gospel. Listen, you shine brightly when you are giving the gospel to other people. When you are making sure that other people are hearing the gospel from you, receiving it from you, having it delivered by you, having accessibility to it because you showed up, you shine like a star 
when you share the gospel with someone. You know, I, I've been a seminary president, as uh, Jamie said, for 19 years. And I've done a lot of public things in ministry. Preached hundreds of sermons, written a handful of books, administrated the seminary through some very big challenges and some significant changes. But do you know what has given me the most excitement in my life of serving as a seminary president? It's been sharing the gospel with people one-on-one -on -one and seeing them come to faith in Jesus Christ. It still eclipses everything else that I do. When I sit down with someone and hold forth the word of life, having a good grip on it myself but offering it to them and asking them to partake, there is something satisfying about that in that moment that is life-altering, life-giving. And what's also interesting is the people who've come to faith in Jesus when I've shared the gospel with them, they stay in relationship with me and in connection with me, and they almost never say to me, how's the seminary going, or I really appreciate the book you wrote, or thank you for that sermon you preached. But I still get handwritten notes from people who say, thank you for telling me about Jesus and introducing me to him. That's what shines most brightly in their lives, not the fact that I've done these things professionally, but that I showed up with the gospel personally and made a difference in their lives. And then he finishes this way. He says, you shine like a star when you share the gospel with people. And then picking up verse 17, you shine like, the, uh, you shine like a star when you serve sacrificially to meet the needs of others. Look at verse 17. He said, but if I'm poured out as a drink offering on the sacrificial service of your faith, now, this is where that word play comes in that I was trying to show you just a moment ago. He says in this last part of this verse, if I'm poured out as a drink offering, I'm offering myself, I'm pouring myself out, I'm pouring myself as a drink offering in the sacrificial service of your faith. In other words, I'm just spilling myself out, spilling myself out to sacrificially serve you. Now, notice the, the, the word play in the text. He says, first, you're holding forth the gospel like a serving platter or like a beverage that you're offering someone. you got a firm grip on it, and you're giving it to them. But now he uses a little bit of a wordplay here. He says, but, but what, if you just, what if you just now switch the analogy and just poured yourself out? Just poured yourself out in sacrificial service of these people that you're trying to reach. It's a beautiful and subtle wordplay in the text. So, you shine like a star with what you say and how you act in expressing your sexuality, your mouth and your morals. But then, in a proactive way, you shine like a star when you share the gospel, holding forth the word of life and offering it to people. And when you do so in such a way that you pour yourself out in sacrificial service of others. My friends, the world in which we live defines leadership by who can get ahead, who can gain the most, who can get the notoriety, who becomes the most popular. This text and countless others say if you really want to make a difference in the lives of people, you won't, you won't pursue any of that. Instead, you will pour yourself out in sacrificial service. And you will do that in such a way, when you do that in, in that way, you will stand out in such a way that people will see you shining the light of Jesus Christ in the darkness of the world in which we're living. My wife and I slipped over that hill in southern Utah and looked at the night sky. And it was like an explosion of a thousand points of light against the blackness of the night sky, which produced the beauty of the experience of that evening. This text says... We have the same capacity. We shine like stars when we act like the Christians we claim to be, when it shows up in our mouths and our morality, and when we offer the gospel and do so in such a way that we pour ourselves out in sacrificial service. When we do these things, we shine like stars in the evening. Let's bow our heads together. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of preaching today and for thinking about these verses together. 
Father, I thank you for the students, faculty, and staff of New Orleans Seminary, and I pray today in the name of Jesus that you will enable them to work out the salvation they have received from you. They will act like the Christians they claim to be and do so trusting your power to sustain them all along the way. And then, Lord, I pray that for all of them and for me, you will help what comes out of our mouths, how we express our morality, how we share the gospel and sacrifice ourselves in serving others to do the same. That you will make us so distinctive in these ways based on this text that we will reflect your light in a very dark world. And that we will intentionally reject all other paths to supposed leadership success and instead choose the path you've outlined for us in this text today. And we receive it from you in Jesus' name. Amen. And thank you for being in chapel today, and God bless you.